everyone, and welcome to my webinar on comparing condensate return pumping options, a review of electric and mechanical products. Specifically, we're going to be comparing electric pumps versus power traps. Now, the name is rather long, so my nickname for this, for all of you Sheldon Cooper and Big Bang Theory fans, is Fun with Pumps. <laughs> All right, but first, I'm going to ask you to take a screenshot of this or please look at the disclaimer. It's impossible to know every single electric pump or non-electric pump in the world. So what I'm going to present today are just some guidelines to help you when you're doing your design or try to understand why there are some issues that need to be mitigated. So please take a look at that. And then I'm going to turn my camera off and we'll get started. Here we go. So we're going to be discussing electric atmospheric condensate pumps. We're not going to be discussing anything other than those pumps that are atmospherically vented. Specifically, we're not going to talk about sophisticated pumping systems working off of high pressure like TLV CPN system, which can handle condensate up to 300 and over 360 degrees Fahrenheit, over 180 degrees Celsius. We're going to talk about simple condensate return. Now, for those of you that attended my webinars before, you know that this is going to start off slowly uh, because we've got a lot of different people from all over the world. We've actually had attendees from over 45 countries, over 4,000 people that have signed up for these webinars. So we're gonna start off easily and then we're gonna build into it about 10 minutes into it. Okay, so we're talking about when a steam trap has positive differential pressure, that is a simple condensate return. The condensate is moved by the, by the steam trap's inlet pressure. So it's the lowest cost, the most reliable, there's no special equipment that's required, and it's easy to implement. So there's the steam trap coming off of the steam equipment. That's the inlet side, and it's got high enough steam pressure to push that condensate all the way down the system, even with the flashing return, all the way into a vented collection tank by the boiler. That's the easiest way to do it, if only it were that simple. Then we pump from the vented tank into the boiler, or the DA unit into the boiler. So let's take a look at negative pressure differential, what can occur sometimes or often. When you've got negative pressure differential, the condensate would back up into the equipment. So we need to have some sort of a pumping system. And here you see our centrifugal pump, and that's because of the steam trap's negative differential return. There's not enough pressure to push it all the way down towards the boiler. So we'll add in a centrifugal pump at this point, and condensate is going to be pumped against the high back pressure, and there you see it. And then ultimately, that's gonna to go to some sort of a tank and go into the boiler. Now, this is a typical floor-mounted receiver. You probably have just a few of these <laughs> in your system somewhere. All right, uh, condensate inlet here, the vent here, uh, pump discharge coming off of the twin pumps there, the duplex unit, and the overflow loop. So. That looked really pretty. Why do they look like this sometimes? You might say too many times. There's your inlet, there's your vent, there's your overflow loop, and there's a discharge. I mean, it didn't look as nice as the previous slide. Why is that? We're going to talk about that today. Pumps are often selected on pumping capacity against a specified discharge pressure, but how much more is necessary to mitigate issues down, down the line? Let's take a look at the intricacies of just the pump itself. You know, the condensate is going to come in here and it's going to be discharged through the volute there. But precise application data will mitigate reliability issues like cavitation damaged impellers. And there you see the impeller in yellow or leaking seals. And there you see the seals circled or broken shafts you know, damaged bearings and burned out motors, which is to the right of the screen. The biggest issue that people complain about is cavitation. So let's take a look at that first, because these are the implications. What are the causes of cavitation and how to mitigate it? Probably a lot of you know about the causes, but how to mitigate it, that's another story. So let's take a look at flash steam, because flashing is what causes cavitation. You may think of flash steam as flash generated during a large pressure drop from a steam trap orifice. And that is true. 
And then you take that flash steam and you put it into a flash vessel of some sort and you vent off the flash and you put liquid condensate into the pump. But why then do you have a cavitating pump? Well, I'm going to explain that. Flash has little mass and it can rapidly collapse. So if you get flash and you see some bubbles over here in the pump, if you get bubbles in the pump, that flash has a little mass and when the condensate is around it, it will rapidly collapse. That accelerating condensate, when the bubble collapses, erodes the impeller. But you also get impeller erosion on startup of the flash. When the flash, not on startup of the pump, but on startup of the flash. When the flash starts, starts happening originally, what's going to happen is has precipitates in the condensate. And when it becomes steam, those precipitates are rapidly accelerated against the impeller. And that causes erosion too. So how do we get a pressure drop to create flash? If you remember from Bernoulli's theorem, if you get a high dynamic, you get a drop in the static. So the rotational velocity of the impeller creates a large pressure drop. On the right, you see like a syringe, and the syringe is pulling out, creating a lower pressure, and you see the bubbles creating as the lower pressure happens. And as soon as the bubbles collapse, you see the syringe rapidly accelerates back. That's pretty much what's happening inside of a cavitating pump. The rotational velocity is causing a low pressure at that lo localized point. Condensate, high temperature condensate is flashing. And then almost as soon as it flashes, it collapses again because of the mass of condensate around it. And you get the cavitation effect. So spin increases the dynamic and reduces the static. And the flash results causing erosion and cavitation. And it looks like this. So let me ask you this question. If you've got a piece of paper nearby, I'm going to ask you a question. Please write it down. How many impellers do you think you would need? How many different types, sizes, pressures, materials would you need to replace every single impeller in all of the condensate pumps that you have in your system? Just write it down a guess. Is it five? Is it 10? Is it 100? Just write it down because we know that impellers can take six to 16 weeks just for the impeller itself. So we can mitigate damage to impellers by making sure that we do a good job with net positive suction head available. That's what the A stands for, available. And there's two ways to do that. You can increase the fill height or you can lower the temperature of the condensate. We're going to get into that a little bit further. But first of all, net positive, that means you're going to take the sum of forces and you're going to make a net positive suction, that's the inlet side, head to the impeller. Net positive suction head. Let's take a look at all of the forces going into the eye of the impeller, which is right here. And let's add them up. And then let's get a, we need a net positive suction head in order to prevent flashing. So here's the required information that you need for a pump, basic requirements. Just going to let you read the screen. Now, what do I mean actual versus design? We don't want pumps and motors to run all the time. So if you have an actual load, you're going to put a sizing factor to make a design load for the pump that's selected. You have to do an accurate total dynamic head TDH calculation. For some people, this is maybe the first time they've read this or they've heard this or they've heard it, but they don't know what it is. A simpler way to explain this is back pressure on the pump. You don't want to be conservative. So if you have like a 20 pound calculated back pressure, 20 PSI, you don't want to say, well, I better just get a pump for 40. You don't want to be that conservative because it can create some issues, which I'll explain later. And you want to know the back pressure variation. So it might be 20 PSI back pressure as long as you're not running the batch in this one unit. But when you're running the batch in this one unit, it might be 25 PSI back pressure or TDH. We have to calculate the net positive suction head that's available. That's the net positive head available on the inlet side of the pump. We want to know the electrical supply, and we're going to select the pump by those basic ideas there. What is TDP? That is the total discharge pressure that the pump can deliver. 
And the NPSHR is net positive suction head, but that is the head required by the pump to prevent cavitation. We also need to know about a flash receiver sizing, the inlet piping size, the vessel diameter, the flash vent diameter. We're going to take a look at the motor horsepower and rating. And you might say, well, I just take uh, the horsepower that the vendor gives to me. That's not necessarily a good idea if you talk about service factor, which I'm going to explain later. And we take a look at panel and the panel enclosure requirements. We have just a couple things that you need here, starters, disconnects, breakers. I'll let you read the rest. All right, so let's take a look at electric requirements for a pump. We're going to summarize it. Please read through this list. So the total dynamic head is the back pressure that is pushing against the uh, pump. And the total discharge pressure is the output of the pump, the pressure that it can deliver. We're going to take a look at a pump curve for those of you that have never read one before. And we're going to go take a look at a simple pump curve and see how you read one. And that's really key to understanding net positive suction head and how to prevent cavitation. So we're going to convert our load from pounds per hour to GPM and provide a rest time for the motors. Why? Because we don't want the motors to get too hot. A lot of people don't know this, but motors have class F insulation and they don't like temperatures greater than 104 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around 40 C. They just don't like it. It causes the insulation to break down. So we'll provide a rest time for the pumps. Okay, so here's a pump on the right. The lighter blue on the left-hand side of the image is the pump and the, the uh, darker blue is almost the purple is the motor itself. In between is the shaft. So there's the inlet to the pump. There's the discharge. It looks so simple. But we know that high temperatures create issues and motors on the right need a cooling time because of that insulation. That's why the design load is commonly two and a half or three times the actual load. So a vendor might say to you, oh, my pump is great. It can work with two times the load. Well, sure it can. You're just gonna have less rest time for the motor and the motor may have a shorter life, but it'll work. It just won't work reliably for as long a period as if you have a design load that's two and a half or three times. We like to give it rest time. So here is 1400 pounds an hour. We divide by 500, the factor 500, which is 8.34 pounds per gallon and times 60. And that's 2.8 GPM is the actual condensate load, converting pounds per hour to gallons per minute. So we multiply by three and we're going to select a pump with a nine GPM capacity. So nine point, uh, sorry, 8.4 is probably not a pump that you would find. So you might find one with a nine GPM capacity. So it's a little more than three times the actual, you might've paid a little more money, but guess what? That pump's going to have more rest time. One of the problems that we can see here is flexible coupling. The beauty about a flexible coupling is it isolates the motor from the heat rather than a straight shaft. The problem with it is it's very difficult to align a flexible coupling and misalignments can cause snaps. So mostly when you have large pumps with flexible couplings, you need laser alignment. Okay, I, pr I promise to talk a little bit about service factor overload. What is that? Your motor horsepower is rated by NEMA with a service factor of one. But NEMA does allow people to overload a motor, make it deliver more horsepower than it's rated for. It's not allowed for totally enclosed fan-cooled motors or explosion-proof motors, but it is allowed for open drip-proof motors. What does that mean? Suppose you selected a pump that had like a one horsepower rating and you go back to the vendor and the vendor thought it was open drip proof. And you said, no, 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 I need it to be totally enclosed, fan cooled or explosion proof. And all of a sudden they give you a one and a half horsepower motor instead. And you said, why did you increase the horsepower? Oh, you need it for totally enclosed, fan cooled or explosion proof. Well, the reason you needed it is on the open drip proof, they were running the motor, the one horsepower motor into overload. And I'm going to show you what overload does to a pump motor. 
So we normally talk about the rating on NEMA, uh, NEMA rating on normal service conditions, 40C104F. And that's really because of the class F insulation and plus or minus 10% of the rated voltage. All right, so take a look at this chart. And this comes um, from an article that I'm going to explain in the next slide. But if we took a one horsepower motor at 3600 RPM, we're allowed to overload it 1.25 times. At 1800 RPM, we can low overload it 1.15 times. So if your job really needs a one and a quarter horsepower motor, which you see now in purple, I can take that one horsepower motor and run it up to 1.25 horsepower on an open drip proof motor and give you that one horsepower motor. And that makes my purchase price to you, my selling price to you lower. The problem with that is you're overloading the motor. So when you go to TEFC or, uh, you know, or explosion proof, now the vendor's got to give you a one and a half horsepower motor or one and a quarter horsepower motor. All right. But if you didn't, say that and if you allow them to go into overload i'm going to show you what overload does to a motor on service factor so this is um, this slide on the previous slide and this particular slide here is based on an article by jim bryant from the electrical apparatus service association in 2018 plant engineering if you have a chance please download that article and he said operating with a service factor greater than one increases the motor winding temperature which affects the insulation and each 10 degree rise in winding temperature reduces motor life by 50 percent so i'm taking a snippet out of his chart and i'm showing you a 20 horsepower motor which is going to be run at 1.15 overload the winding temperature goes up from 56 celsius to 19 so what is 1.15? That just means the motor horsepower is going from 20 to 23. It's just three horsepower into overload. You use this formula where you're 19 degrees divided by 10 degrees, which is the rise that the, uh, reduces by 50%, and that's the exponent, and you do the calculation and there's your life. So that extra three horsepower, 15% over the rating reduces the life by 73%. Will the pump last one year? Sure, the pump and motor will last one year. Will it last the original eight years? No, it's probably going to last two years. And that's why you're going to buy three more motors because somebody gave you an overloaded motor. Don't buy a motor that's overloaded on the horsepower. And that's why you want to take a look at the pump curves. All right, we're going to switch off of uh, that and go to TDH now, total dynamic head, and take a look at the individual components. And we're going to understand the open bypass effect, what this does to back pressure. Because bypasses around equipment can help change the TDH, which we don't want to change the TDH, but that's what happens. So we're going to take a look at these design requirements to mitigate electric trips and motor damage and promote reliable pumping. All right, so how do we calculate TDH? Well, we need the vertical lift that the pump is gonna discharge the condensate overhead. We have to understand that there's gonna be a certain back pressure that we're dealing with in the return header from flash steam for sure, but possibly from live steam if it's being blown into the system. We have to take a look at if the piping was undersized because originally the piping system was designed to be four inches, let's say, or three inches. But over the last 30, 40 years, there's been so much corrosion in the line that instead of having the internal ID of a three inch pipe, it has the internal ID of a one and a half or two inch pipe. That's gonna make a big, big difference on the frictional loss. And then we're gonna to have to calculate the pipe friction to understand what that loss is. What is the receiver tank pressure? Is it pumping into a pressurized flash vessel? Is it pumping into an atmospheric flash vessel? And the equipment that we're getting the condensate from, is it in vacuum or not? So let's take a look at a typical TDH calculation. 
Here we see some hot water heat exchanger, could be a converter, could have process fluid in there, but it looks more like water to me, product in, product out. All right, so steam comes in and you see the condensate level. Now, we've got to calculate the vertical lift. So take a look at the right-hand side, and there's the vertical lift, 23 feet. Why did I choose 23 feet? To make it easy, because 2.31 feet is equal to a pound of hydraulic head. So there you go. Dividing 23 by 2.31, you get about 10 PSI of lift pressure. And then we have piping frictional losses, which arbitrarily I'm just going to select as about 3 PSI. And then the destination vessel pressure to make it easy, look inside the condensate return header at the right, and that pressure is 10 PSI. All right, so add those three components up, and that's our total dynamic head, it's 23 PSI. It's not that difficult. Our back pressure, our total back pressure is 23 PSI. There is something known as velocity head, but I have not put that into this calculation. And I'm just going to lump in velocity head with frictional loss and say it's about 3 PSI. So total is about 23 PSI. Here is an elevated receiver over a pump. And the pump's discharge capability coming out of the right side of that pump. We have the back pressure or the TDH, the total dynamic head, pushing down as a resistance against the pump. We have the pump delivering a discharge pressure, counteracting the TDH. And in order to get flow, the TDP, the discharge pressure, must always be greater than the total dynamic head. Pumps have a fixed discharge pressure curve. If condensate or steam is added into the return, that increases the back pressure. Well, how can that happen? Well, it can happen from a batch operation or new equipment being added into the return or somebody deciding that they're going to go on bypass into a pumped header rather than a flashing header. Not a good idea. So these type of things can create problems if they're put into the return header. So we've got to consider future and operating conditions when selecting a, a pump. All right, now we're going to take a look at NPSH and TDH considerations combined together. We're going to start off with taking a look at available NPSH versus required by the manufacturer. We're going to look at different speed motors and how that makes an effect or a difference and load change and TDH change. This is a really important section to understand how to prevent cavitation and impeller damage and promote reliable pumping. All right, this is a very simple pump curve. For those of you that have never seen a pump curve before, it might be a little bit of, oh, wow, because I'm going to go through a lot of different points. But believe me, it's a very simple curve. I've left the efficiency curves off of this pump curve. And before I forget, I want to thank Jack Pearson from our engineering team for putting a lot of these slides together, including these pump curves. Uh, all right, so let's take a quick look. We're going to take a pump that's rated for 37 and a half GPM at 30 PSI discharge pressure. So here we go. The bottom scale is the capacity right here. And here is the discharge pressure right here. So we're going to follow that blue curve, the lower blue curve, which is the pump curve. And there is 37 and a half GPM at 30. Did you see it? 37 and a half GPM at 30. Now, notice that the curve ends at point B, which is a TDP, a discharge pressure, of 25. That means that the pump needs to have a back pressure on it that is at least 25 PSI or greater. And if not, we see that the horsepower curve ends at C, so you would start overloading that motor, and you could get a burnout. So, if the system is less than 25 PSI, it may burn out the motor or certainly going to cause a trip. And for that reason, what people do is they like to increase the head and they would put a throttling valve on there. But if they don't pay attention to how they put that throttling on there, you know, they put a throttling valve after the pump. That's great. Um, and here we have, they increase the pressure that it has to work against the back pressure to 35. Look at that, points D to E. 
look what happens to the capacity. The pump capacity drops down. It was here at 37 and a half, and now it's dropped down to around 29 GPM. That's still adequate because remember, we selected the pumping system with a sizing factor of around three times. No problem at all. And what we notice about high speed pumps, so called high efficiency pumps, is that they're less sensitive to increased change in a TDH. So let's take a look though on the net positive suction head required. That's at point G. That's the, the NPSH required curve right here from the manufacturer. And we see that that is nine and a half feet. So we need a net positive suction head available on this system of nine and a half feet or greater to prevent the pump from cavitating. One thing I'll say about high speed pumps, like a 3,500 RPM pump, some people call them high efficiency pumps, but I don't know. It might be high efficiency in the sense that you can use a smaller horsepower motor and spin it faster and get a greater discharge pressure over here. So you can use a three quarter inch horsepower motor. But I know that speed, power changes by the cube from the affinity laws. So running from 1750 up to 3500, that's going to use a lot more energy. So I'm not so sure that that's really a high efficiency pump. And we know that these pumps are very sensitive to high temperature condensate. Look at the NPSH. And they're also sensitive to problems here, but you can just put a throttling valve as far as the TDH requirements. But the temperature, no, nah, that's not the whole easy to handle. You can handle it if you can elevate the receiver. But frankly, if you're using 3,500 RPM pumps, unless you've got extremely cool condensate, that's just asking for problem. Those 3,500 RPM pumps need a lot of NPSHR, uh, I mean A, for the pump. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the characteristics. Is a low cost option, sure, because you're taking a smaller horsepower motor. It's less sensitive when the TDH is greater than the rated discharge pressure of the pump. As you saw, when it went from 30 to 35, you know, it was about 18% higher. It was no problem. But it's very sensitive when the TDH is less than a TDP because it had a very steep curve, if you remember that. Let's go back and take a quick look. Look at how steep this curve is. And that can cause a motor burnout or a circuit trip. And you want to use exercise caution on the TDH calculation. But what people do is put a throttling valve in there. You just don't want to put the throttling valve in there and throttle it too much. It is very sensitive to high temperature condensate. So we have got to make sure that that temperature reaching the pump is either reaching it from a very high uh, elevation or it's going to be really cool. And remember that these high speed pumps from the cubed affinity law have a big power requirement. All right, so let's take a look at where a throttling valve typically goes. It's right there. It can be manual on some, you know, really sophisticated systems, which you'll typically see in bigger plants like paper mills or power plants, uh, or you'll see them in refineries and petrochemical plants. It'll be an automatic control valve. So let's go to a low NPSH pump, a 3,500, I'm sorry, a 1,750 RPM pump. For a lot of engineers, a low NPSH pump is the panacea of pump decisions. Just go to low NPSH pump. Okay, so let's take a look at the same pump, 37 and a half GPM at 30 PSI discharge pressure. There's 37 and a half at 30. Let's see it one more time. You notice that point A, that the blue line, the pump curve, is not anywhere near as steep as the previous 3,500 RPM pump. And notice that this TDP curve ends at not 25 PSI, but at 21 PSI. Do you see it right here? So it is less sensitive if the TDH is less than what was decided. You selected a pump for 30 TDP, 
and the TDH is only 21, that's fine. It's still within its horsepower curve. But watch this. Take a look at points D to E. If you made a mistake, or if the pipe had corrosion, or if equipment gets added onto the system later on, and we don't know about it, other pumps come into this return header, batch operations get added on. If that TDH increases from 30 to 33, look at point D and look what happens to the capacity because it's not a very steep curve. The capacity drops from 37 and a half GPM to four GPM. Wow, that's almost a 90% reduction in capacity. That's one of the key issues with low speed pumps. They are very sensitive to increased TDH over the rating. So the nice thing about them, which is why people select them, if you look at point G, is look at that. The NPSH is around one. Specifically on this pump, it's 1.2 feet of NPSH. You can almost always have 1.2 feet of NPSH if your receiver is just a little bit off the ground. So the thing that we know about low NPSH pumps is they tend to be very, very sensitive to a total dynamic head that's above the TDP rating of the pump. You got to be careful for that. So let's take a look. Similar capacity pump we selected it has a very low NPSH requirement. The 3500 pump required nine and a half feet. This required 1.2 feet. It is less sensitive to the change in TDH. The 3500 RPM pump, you know, it had a problem if the TDH was under 25. This one was all the way down to 21. It is very sensitive to TDH conditions that are greater than the TDP. The 3500 RPM pump was good 18%, no problem. It only dropped off about 20% of the capacity. When this one went up, when the 1750 pump went up, only 10%, not 18%, only 10% above the TDH, it lost 90% of its pumping capacity, which means the condensate's gonna be just blowing out of that overflow. And that's why we've gotta be extremely cautious on the TDH calculation. So for me, if I were selecting an electric low-speed pump, I would use a conservative TDP purchase. So instead of going uh, 30 PSI, I might select one for 40 PSI and then throttle it as I need to. The problem with that is that's gonna potentially have a higher horsepower motor and use more energy, but at least another pump is always gonna work. And that's why we have pumps installed, right? To get the condensate back to the boiler. So let's take a look at net positive suction head. The sum of forces pushing condensate through the impeller. Uh, I've got two blue components. The fill head is the height of water at the inlet to the impeller eye, because every 2.13, every 2.31 feet is equal to one psi. And the receiver pressure, which is this is a vented receiver, which is 14.7, 14.696 psia. But the vapor pressure of the liquid, the closer it is to 14.7 PSIA, the more it wants to flash. So the hotter it gets, the higher the vapor pressure. And we're gonna show that on a chart. And then the frictional losses are a detriment. They pull away from the net positive suction head. But the fact of the matter is, if you had a, an inlet from a tank to a, a, if you went from a tank to a pump inlet, and the piping was so small that it had a high frictional loss, what would you do? Just increase the size of the piping. So really the frictional loss should not be a big issue. All right, let's take a look at a vapor pressure table. 212 is the temperature of boiling water at atmosphere, and there you see it. So now a lot of pump manufacturers are low speed pump manufacturers, the low NPSH pumps. They say that they can work up to 210 degrees Fahrenheit. I didn't see any above that, by the way, for a typical atmospheric low speed pump. Now let's take a look at that vapor pressure, 14.12. By the way, the low end PSH pump manufacturers, it was interesting. I looked at quite a few manufacturers and they said, we'd like to have condensate at 200 degrees or less. We can handle up to 210. So you decide what that means. All right, here's net positive suction head. 
there we see the receiver and the pump on the right. So the condensate temperature is at 210 degree Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit. Remember what that vapor pressure was. I have an elevated receiver. So take a look at that, it's three feet, which is gonna give me 1.3 PSI. See the three feet of fill head right there? And then there I have my first calculation component of the fill head at three feet, 1.3 PSI. Now the receiver pressure is at zero. So that's 14.7. The atmosphere pressure is pushing down. My vapor pressure is 14.12 from the table for 210 condensate. And my frictional loss, I just made an arbitrary 0.2 PSI. And there is my net positive suction head available of 3.88 feet. There you go. It's just that simple. I've got 3.88 feet with this elevated receiver. Now let's take a look at that pump curve again. <clears throat> so to prevent cavitation, the net positive suction head available, 3.88 feet, must be greater than the net positive suction head required. And that is what was provided by the pump manufacturer. So if we take a look at the 3,500 RPM pump, there was our 37 and a half at 30, but if you remember, it, it needed 9.5 feet of NPSHR. We only have 3.88 feet of NPSHA available. Is that pump gonna work? Nope, it's not gonna work. And it's gonna have a cavitating problem. So if we wanna avoid cavitation with this pump, we can do one of two things. With this pump, not a different pump, with this one. We can increase the fill head on the pump or we can decrease the condensate temperature. How would you decrease the condensate temperature? I mean, it's probably the only way to do it. Well, there's a couple ways to do it, but well, the only way to do it would be to add water. That would be kind of crazy. All right, people do it, but I mean, that would be one of the ways to do it. All right, let's take a look at decreasing the temperature. However we've done that, we decrease the temperature to 200 degrees. Now, our vapor pressure goes from 14.12 to 11.53. So let's take this cool condensate temperature, relatively cool on this 3,500 uh, RPM pump. That makes a new vapor pressure. Let's run through the calculations. There they are. That makes an NPSH available of 9.86 feet. And the pump needed 9.5 feet. So now it will work just by dropping the temperature 10 degrees. We could also elevate the receiver. So here, the condensate temperature is 210 degrees Fahrenheit. I didn't cool it, I kept it hot at 210. I made a fill head of nine and a half feet on the receiver over the pump inlet. And now that makes 4.11 PSI of head. There's the receiver pressure, 14.7. There's the vapor pressure, the high vapor pressure, 14.12. The frictional loss, I increased at another 0.1 because it's higher elevation. Than I don't know. And now the NPSH available is 10.1 feet from that elevation. That's greater than 9.5 required by the pump. So this system will also work. The question is, can you elevate the receiver nine and a half feet? Well, I mean, if you're taking the condensate down from a higher level, don't put the receiver on the floor. If you're going into the basement of a building, elevate that receiver. And if you're on uh, you know, platforms and you've got different stages on your different units out in a petrochemical plant or something like that, keep the receiver high so you get a lot of fill head on the pump. All right, now let's take a look at a 1750 RPM pump, a low speed pump. So we had 3.88 feet available with the original calculation, only three feet elevation on the receiver. That's greater than the pump, which required 1.2 feet of NPSHR and cavitation isn't expected. And as long as you're with the TDH is within the horsepower limit and you don't go over the TD, TDP rating of the pump over here, that's gonna be good operation. And that's why people like low speed, low NPSH pumps. But remember, do not allow the motor to be overloaded. And you have to be really careful with this calculation not to go above the TDP. Well, that's it for that portion of NPSH and TDH. Let's take a look at flash steam again. And you saw this screen earlier. 
the flash has to be properly vented before it hits the pump. I'm going to say that again. The flash must be properly vented before it hits the pump because that can reduce the pressure and temperature of the condensate going into the pump impeller. So there is an error, a huge error that is commonly made in the design of these systems, particularly with floor mounted pumps by not mending the flash steam prior to the pump. And the solution is to install a flash receiver. Here's the receiver. There's a vent pipe. And you say, well, I've got a receiver and a vent pipe. Okay, well, let's take a look. Condensate comes in here. We need the vent off the flash so that the condensate coming into the pump is cooler and doesn't have any pressure or high temperature involved with it. And you can say, well, I do that. Okay, well, let's take a look. So here is this pump that I showed earlier, and there's the vent line. Now, if you've seen flash tanks, does that vent on that receiver look about the same size as you would expect for a flash tank vent? And you're gonna say no, because it isn't. That is not, that is a vent, but it is not a flash vent. And that is the common misconception that people make. That is a balance line. What happens is the pump receiver here, the floor mounted receiver, is full of vapor. And in order for condensate to come in, it's got to push the vapor out somewhere. And that line is a balancing line to allow the vapor to escape the receiver. And it allows vapor to come back into the receiver as the condensate level drops. It is not a flash vent. It's a small vent that equalizes pressure as the water level changes. It's too small for flash. And if you use it for flash, what happens is the condensate pressure and temperature increases because you build the pressure up inside of the pump. And a small condensate receiver has other problems, particularly it causes frequent cycling of the motors. And more cycling of the motors, more on-off operation is going to accelerate the wear. The small vent increases the temperature, lowers the NPSHA, causes cavitation, overheats the motor, and damages the pump seals. If you do order these pumps, it is always important to have isolation valves here so that you can isolate the pump motor, pump assembly from the receiver if you need to do repair. And on this particular system, they're gonna need to do a lot of repairs. It's got everything wrong. It's got a small vent. It's got a floor mounted receiver. So you remember that the NPSH available influences, if you have leaking traps going into that receiver, People don't calculate that. And I say, well, when was the last time you did a trap survey? Oh, like three, four years ago. Well, do you think that that's gonna give you any kind of bleed steam into the line that's feeding your condensate system? I never thought about that. And you see that equipment that's on bypass? That equipment that's on bypass, you think that that's blowing any steam into the condensate line that's going into the receiver? I didn't think about that. And you've got some level pots there in some of the petrochemical plants or refineries. And you think that those outlet control valves are blowing steam through. Let me take a look at the data, the DCS data. Oh yeah, look at that. Wow, it's the, the level pot was empty and the valve was open. Okay. And we have batch product operation. That's in blue because we need to have batch products for our production plant, but we also have to calculate that change in, the t in what is coming into the system in terms of flash. And we add new equipment. We have to make sure the receiver can handle the flashing condensate from the batch products and the new equipment. So the red is live steam and the blue is flash steam. We've got to be able to handle that with a receiver that has a proper size vent, a properly sized vent. If it's undersized, it can build the pressure up. Let's say, what happens if the pressure just increases to two and a half PSI because the vent was too small? Well, the condensate temperature for steam at two and a half PSI is 220 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a vapor pressure of 17.19 PSIA. So let's do the NPSH available calculation. There's our fill head because the pump is three feet high. The receiver is three feet rather higher than the pump. Our receiver pressure now is not 14.7, but it's pressurized. So it's two and a half PSI higher, it's 17.2. Our vapor pressure is right about 17.2 <laughs> and our frictional loss is still the same 0.2 
now our NPSH available is 2.56 feet. Now remember, the high-speed pump, 3,500, needed 9.5 feet. Even with an elevated receiver, that is not going to work. But the low NPSH pump only needed 1.2 feet, so that would actually work in this situation, which is the benefit of having a receiver, even if that receiver is only three feet higher than the pump. I don't like floor-mounted receivers, in case you can get that idea, and I definitely don't like floor-mounted receivers with undersized vents. So let's take a look at this installation right here. There is the condensate inlet. There's the overflow. That is going to be used a lot, which is what you're seeing going on right here, and that's why. But I want to take a look at something I talked about earlier. There is the eye of the impeller to the pump in the red line. That blue line is an approximate high-level water mark. When the water gets that high, the pumps are going to trip on and cycle. And when it gets that low, the yellow line, they're going to shut off so they don't run the pumps dry. And that's going to be the discharge. You know, you could take a tank, let's say it's a 45 gallon tank, and you could figure out how much is being pumped there. It looks about 10 gallons, you know, 12 gallons in cycles, something like that. So if you had a larger receiver that was elevated, you could drop that level and you would get a lot more in a discharge cycle, and that would make the pumps last longer. But look at the distance between the yellow line and the red line. That low le level and that red line, that is the positive suction height or hydraulic head on the motors. What is that? It's like fill head of like three inches or 2.2 PSI fill head. So there's your receiver pressure, 17.2. There's your vapor pressure, there's your frictional loss, but the fill head from that yellow line to the red line is only about three inches, 0.2. No pump is gonna work under this situation because that is a 0 0.02 feet of NPSHA. Even a low speed pump is not gonna work under this. <clears throat> and that's the problem with insufficient NPSHA in floor mounted receivers. Elevated receivers increase the NPSHA. Small receivers increase the cycling and wear. Yes, I'm a big fan of elevated receivers. I know that's a big secret, right? <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a look at our little electric condensate pump here. 37 and a half GPM at 30 PSI. What does that mean in terms of actual load? Well, if I multiply 37 and a half GPM by uh, 500, I get 18,750 pounds an hour. So, you know, the actual load might have been like 35 GPM and they just got the next pump. So we're going to approximate what that actual load is. It could be somewhere like divide by three, it's like 6,000 pounds an hour. Divide by two, it's 9,000 pounds an hour. I divided by two and a half, and I said somewhere around 7,500 pounds an hour is the actual load. And the flash off of that would be 997, or just about 1,000 pounds an hour. Why did I do that? Well, I want to select a flash vessel. I want to select a typical flash vessel that you would design if you're using an ASHRAE section or if you were using any other calculations that you use to size a flash vessel. And the flash vessel at 10 feet per second, which is normally the recommended flash velocity of the vessel, is going to be 12 inches or greater. And the vent, we like to run 50 to 70 feet per second, never higher than 70 feet per second. That's a five inch vent, but you're not going to want to put five inch piping on it. So it'll be a six inch vent because if you use the four inch vent, that would be 84 feet per second. And that's when people complain that they have water droplets coming out of their flash vent that can scald people. So we like to go at a six inch vent on this system. Now look at that pump. Does that 37 and a half GPM pump, does it look like it's got a six inch vent on it or a four inch vent on it? No, it's got a small vent on it. And you say, well, that's just a graphic that your CES group drew up. Well, yeah, they tried to make it representative though. So I took a look at actually over five pump manufacturers and I just did a representative one. Some of them had, I mean, nobody had higher than what I'm gonna show here. So there's the vent size, the velocity, the pressure drop because you're not gonna take a vent pipe and just put it up two feet and let it just go up there into the room, right? You're gonna move it over to the side or move it out a, a, a wall, or you're gonna move it somewhere where it's safely piped away. So I put about 12 
feet of piping in there and I want to calculate the pressure drop through that pipe and the steam temperature of the condensate or for that pressure. So pump manufacturer one had a one and a quarter size vent. The velocity would be 715 feet per second with a thousand pounds an hour of flash steam. That would be 10 times, more than 10 times the velocity that we recommend as a maximum. The pressure drop would be 4.8 PSI, which means that you would have 4.8 PSI built up inside of that receiver and the steam temperature for that 4.8 PSI could be as high as 227. Pump manufacturer two was one and a half inch. There's the calculations, 219. And pump manufacturer three had a two inch vent. So you see the pressure drops 4.8, 2.1, 0.6. And this is not calculating any blowing traps. This is not calculating that vent size having to discharge any steam from open bypasses. And this is not calculating that vent line having to deal with any steam from blow through on control valves. This is only talking about the thousand pounds an hour flash. So one of the ways to do that for any type of a pump could be to have a flash vessel, get the correctly sized flash vent there, and then the balance line into the receiver. You don't really need to have that way. You could just use the flash vessel if the correct vent as a you know, combination receiver flash tank. It's not gonna hurt to have a floor mounted receiver like that. And if you did a floor mounted receiver like that, you're gonna be so much happier with the way they work especially if you've got you have to make sure you have everything else done in terms of NPSHA and that's two of the things that we look at as critical for the vessel now let's mitigate receiver pressurization upstream flash tank or knockout pot flash velocity to this Maintain the trap population in good health. You cannot have a lot of steam traps blowing through because you haven't fixed traps for three years. And you close open bypasses on equipment. You have to find out why the bypasses are open and fix those issues at the source and mitigate blow through and outlet control valves. And make sure that the flash receiver size is adequate for extra condensate loads when you put in a batch operation. So when you put in a batch operation and you're gonna tie it into the line, Go take a look at the pumps and the flash receivers downside from that and make sure that you've got enough capability. If not, add to that capability because otherwise, I mean, it's like pay me now or pay me later. You, if you put too much flash in that system, you could pressurize the pump and you're going to be dumping the condensate and then the pump becomes worthless. So why even put it in? Okay, so if we're doing electric pumps, here we have a bank of pumps. Uh, what do we need to worry about for the pump and motor? Well, here you go. Now this is uh, gonna be recorded, so you can take a look at this from recording and stop it as much as you want. Here's some basics. Whew. Okay, uh, I'm not done, sorry. Oh, okay. Wow, I didn't know I needed to do that. That's just for the pump and motor. How about the control panel? Yep. That's just the basics. And then we're going to need three trades to put it in. That's what you want to really pay attention to about what you're getting with the pump to make sure you're quoting apples to apples. You're not getting motors that are overloaded and things like that. Now, I do a little bit about variable frequency drive and variable speed drives. My buddy in the UK, uh, Mike Povey, you know, he helped me with this because he does a lot with variable speed drives. He's the general manager of the UK. And also another one of my friends, Tim Tilly, helped with that. And you know, they have a lot of experience with this. And they're flexible to match changes in TDH. They can have a lower energy cost in NPSHR when the speed reduces. And they're an alternative to fixed speed operation. And throttling valves might not be needed. The thing about a variable frequency drive, variable speed drive pump is that the curve tends to be flat like a 1750 RPM pump. So what happens is unlike a fixed drive pump that if you were running it all the way high at let's say like 40 or 50 PSI TDP, that's gonna consume a lot of energy with a fixed drive pump. If you had a throttling valve behind it, that's gonna consume a lot of energy because it's a fixed drive pump. It's always working at that speed and it's always pumping against that pressure. 
But with a variable speed drive pump, you basically take that flattened curve or flatter curve and you bring it down to match what you need to match in terms of the discharge pressure or the load. And, and that way you get a reduction in your energy consumption. So that's good. The problem with it is, is you have to have the horsepower equivalent to the lower speed. So it might be higher horsepower pump and it might be a higher capital cost, definitely because of the equipment. Uh, I understand that the capital cost could be 20 to 25% higher. And you've got a more sophisticated control system. It's more of a complex unit to troubleshoot, tends to be more of a custom unit, and there's limited purchase options. I didn't see a lot of condensate pump manufacturers that make variable speed drives or offer variable speed drives. All right, well, that's it for electric pumps. And I'm gonna talk about power trap pumps for the next 20, 25 minutes. I think that these are easily accomplished condensate recovery. So we take a look at the first slide and there you see the power trap and receiver set. And that was what we looked at earlier with condensate being pumped against a high back pressure. There's the power trap assembly. There's a receiver with a vent. There's the pump line. And that's going into another long term, you know, long distance receiver away. So pumping it into the boiler house. All right. It looks pretty simple, right? Let's take a look at power trap pump operation. First of all, you're going to see there's an inlet check valve and an outlet check valve that keeps pressure in the body, an intake valve for the motive source, and an exhaust valve so that the motor source can motive source can be released. So as the condensate level rises, we're going to bring some steam or air in. That's the darker color, pushing a positive displacement on our larger pump of about eight gallons outward. And then we're going to cycle again because there's a, a spring actuator there if you see it in the center and this spring actuator is going to cause the valves to alternate at the top and it's just that simple and take a look at those parts i mean you got a ball float you got this mechanism here and you have two valves up here and two check valves not a lot of parts so the first thing is another one of my buddies in the UK, Dave is a diver and I always see his diving pictures. So I've named my little snorkeler here, Dave, and I, I hope Dave understands this with all respect for him. So we're gonna talk about snorkeler Dave breathing, breathe in and exhaust out. So the condensate comes into a pump and it goes out of the pump there through the check valves. We're gonna get the condensate pumping out with mode of steam. And then in order for new condensate to come in, just like the vent on a receiver, it's got to exhaust what's in the body. There's a vapor in the body, which is steam or air. So it's got to exhaust it. So those are two critical things, which I call breathe. Power trap pump has to breathe. So there's Dave. He's got to breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. And so does our pump. It has to breathe in and breathe out without obstruction. So let's take a look at a power trap pump. And now you see the check valves for the condensate in and out. And we take a look at the motive line. And remember, Dave, got to breathe motor steam in, supply that into the pump. What we don't want to happen is you see where the yellow arrow is. We don't want that level to build up with condensate. If the condensate builds up too high, it would go into the motive supply of the pump. Could you imagine a snorkeler? breathing water in as they're trying to breathe air in. That's not good. We don't want that to happen. So we put a motive trap and check valve there and we discharge the condensate out. And that way we have a nice clean motive supply. Now in order in that short distance, and it is a short distance between the motive supply and the trap in terms of vertical head where that yellow arrow is, we like to use a free float. If you're not using TLV, we recommend you use a float trap. But we don't like to use a disc trap, a bucket trap, or a thermostatic trap, even if those would be TLV models. We don't like to use those because they're cyclical and they can allow the condensate to back up into the pump and therefore we don't use them. We just use either a free float for our product or a float for somebody else. That would be the recommendation. Now, steam is wet. 
if you read one of my articles in May of chemical engineering in 2020, uh, you'll see about steam quality conditions, but people often refer to wet steam and the wet side of the plant. Well, all steam is wet, but if it's really wet, we know that water is flowing along the bottom, especially in plants that haven't done very proactively focused, sustained steam trap management programs. They can have block traps that are keeping condensate flowing across the bottom. That's not good. Anyway, water isn't trained in the steam in everybody's system that's not superheated. So if you've got a long distance and you're not sure the quality of the supply of steam, you can always put in a separator. And if the pressure is high from your source, you can also put in a little PRV to reduce the pressure. In any event, that's part of breathing the mode of supply of steam or air to the pump. And it's an important part of breathing. Now we're going to talk about exhausting out. Think about our little snorkeler Dave here and breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. Suppose that Dave had to breathe through a long tube on the exhale and that exhale had a lot of water in it. I mean, would that be easy to do? I think you would say that that's not a good idea. And that's why we don't want to have any loops on the exhaust loop on the exhaust piping, not for Dave and not for a power trap. No loops. So if the snorkeler has to exhale high, you wouldn't put piping that's 30 feet high. Why? Because too much pressure drop. Less than 10 feet for our pump is good. Over 10 feet is too high. I would recommend that for anybody, it's too high. And here's why. If you're using steam, condensate can condense on the side of the pipe wall and build a waterhead over the exhaust valve. And that's kind of like taking the most expensive car, sports car you can think about and putting your foot over the exhaust. It's not gonna work that well when you've got a back pressure on the exhaust. So we don't wanna see that and we don't wanna see it too high. It has to be less than 10 feet and then it's gonna be just fine. Now, there are some applications with power traps, in particular with pump traps, where you're going to high reboilers or something like that, where you might have it greater than 10 feet. But in a pump, you normally don't have that. In a pump trap, maybe, but not in a pump. But let's say for some reason you did have it over 10 feet and the water level is going to build up. What you just do is put in a little bypass loop like that. You see it? It's just a valve and a check valve, and then it'll drain down. And it's just that simple. But here you see a GP10, which is the largest pump that we make. It's a three by two. The package is only 60 inches high, about 60 inches high. It's actually a little less, I think it's 59 and something. Five feet is less than 10 feet, that's fine. And there you see the equalization. There it is, right there in the green. So uh, yeah, maybe this looks like me in my earlier days. <laughs> I'm six feet one. You know, let's take a guy six feet tall, plenty of room there, right? Lots of room. All right, so let's take, a, here's the right side of the view of the pump and here's the left side view of the pump. So watch the equalization. It's very easy to get good equalization in less than 10 feet if you've got a pump set like this. You don't need to have highly elevated receivers because you don't have an NPSH problem. So this is actually, I was debating whether to use this slide or not because this is a power trap pump trap assembly. And right here you see the trap. But we're not talking about pump trapping. We're talking about pumping. So I'm gonna just block that out. And that's what the typical inside of a pump looks like. Well, we're gonna show how to do the design versus the actual load, the total dynamic head and the fill head requirements. This is a little GP5C. The C stands for compact and the five stands for five bar. Some of us say that the GP stands for great pump. <laughs> I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> All right, so it's only nine inches tall. Now think about that. That's probably the size of most of your feet. I mean, you know, a lot of your feet, you know, my foot's of size 14, right? Okay, but this is a fill height for this. 
from the grade, we measure from the grade, not the eye of an impeller, because there's no impeller. The fill head from grade to make it easy. How high off the ground? Six inches. So if you use 75 PSI, which is the five bar 0.5 megapascal rating of the pump, a GP5C, and a back pressure of 15 PSI, you can use steam or air, but with steam, your capacity is 280 pounds an hour. And with air, it's 350 pounds an hour. I mean, for a small application, you want to take some uh, tracer lines, you want to take a small piece of cooking equipment, a very small batch operation. You have a small heating coil that you need to put something into. I mean, there it is. There's a nice little pump. Actually, people use these with humidifiers, like in hospital systems, and they have steam humidifiers up, up above the ceiling. They can use these pumps to get the condensate out. All right, so uh, if you take the elevation of the fill head from six inches to 40 inches, it has approximately 800 pounds an hour capacity. So it's so small, 40 inches is just a little higher than table level. And if you get that much, you can almost triple the capacity of that unit. But if you don't have that, and or if you will need a little more capacity, we go to the next version, which is the GP10L. 10 for 10 bar, one megapascal. L for a, a little, little capacity. It's 15 inches high, it's a little pump. It's not compact, but it is little, 15 inches high. It needs a fill head of 25 inches, and it'll work with 150 pound pressure, so we can go against higher back pressures. And there's the capacity, 3,000 pounds an hour. Approximately between the motive pressure and the discharge pressure for any of these pumps, it's a good idea to have about a seven PSI difference, seven or eight PSI difference. So you go from 150 and return condensate against the back pressure of 140. It's going to decrease the capacity, but you can do it. Just because I'm showing 15 on the top and 25 on the bottom doesn't mean that it's limited to that. So please take a look at the charts. That's 3,000 pounds an hour here on 150 to 25. But if I increase the fill head to 55 inches, I get 4,000 pounds an hour. If I don't have 25 inches, I can actually, on the little pump, I can bring this fill head all the way down to 18 inches. So I'm a 14, 14 uh, size foot. It's just a little higher than my foot. And I get 60% of that capacity. So I get around 1,800 pounds an hour, uh, you know, 14, 18 inches off of the ground. That's pretty good, right? Also good for really small coils. Now. We have another pump, which is our middle size pump or medium size pump, a GP14M, which means it's good for 1.4 megapascals, 14 bar, or 200 PSI motive. But I'm using the same capacity, the same pressure, 150 at 25 back pressure, and this is now good for 5,000 pounds an hour. And if I elevate it to 55 inches, it's good for 5,500 pounds an hour to 6,000, depending with the steam or air. I can also bring this down to 18 inches and get 81% capacity. So I can get 4,000 pounds an hour out of this pump if I'm feeding the pump 18 inches off the ground. So I can bring pipe out of equipment that's low-lying outlet equipment 18 inches off the ground Make sure the pipe is adequately sized to vent. Put a proper vent on it, and 18 inches off the ground, I can feed that pump and get 4,000 pounds an hour. Pretty cool. And I can go as low as 14 inches off the ground, the size of my foot, essentially, and I can get 3,000 pounds an hour. Come out of very low equipment, put a proper size pipe in there, a proper vent in there, 14 inches off the ground, and feed this pump. <clears throat> but if I need more capacity, I go to the three by two GP10. That is less than 24 inches tall to the top of the lift. And that will give me 16,000 pounds an hour capacity with a 36 inch fill height. That's just a little higher than a typical table, three feet tall, just a little less than a meter. And I can get 16,000 pounds an hour. If I increase the fill height to 60 inches, I can get 18,000 pounds an hour. Oh my goodness, is that cool. 
I can also bring that down as low as 30 inches below a typical table or countertop, and I'm going to get around 14,000 pounds an hour capacity. So this is a workhorse, quite a nice unit. <clears throat> Let's take a look at my question I asked you earlier. I asked you how many impellers you would need with an electric pump. Let's talk about power trap pump maintenance. There you see the inner workings of a power trap. I'm going to take off the body, the receiver body, if you will. And what are we going to, what do we have? Well, we've got a float. We've got a lever arm and actuating spring actuating mechanism. And then at the top, we've got the valves, the motor valve and the exhaust valve. It's not really that many parts. Think about the intricacies of a motor, the intricacies of a pump. It's really not that many parts. So take a look at your GP5C, your GP14M, uh, and your GP10. Now, I showed you four pumps, but most likely you could standardize on three or two pumps. Let's say you standardized on these three pumps. All of the workings that you see on top are contained in the cover unit. So you could stock three spare cover and mechanism units. And if you had to do repair on one of those three pumps at the bottom, you just take off the bolts, replace the unit. You would have some sort of a flange or union connection. You would replace the unit and take the cover and mechanism unit back to your bench and repair it there. So it's a relatively quick replacement. You only need three spare cover and mechanism units for every single condensate pump in your plant. How cool would that be? All right, I want to talk a little bit about vertical tanks. A lot of people like vertical tanks. I'm okay with vertical tanks feeding a trap. When it comes to pumps, yeah, I'm not so good about vertical tanks. I don't like them, frankly. It's a personal preference, and I'm going to tell you why. Let's suppose I've got a pump there where the trap was. If I've got a water column there, that water column is going to rise and fall, something like that. The displaced volume is only that much. And my fill head is only what's indicated by the blue arrow. It's not a lot of uh, fill head on a pump if it's an electric pump. If you have if you're going to make a receiver, why not make it horizontal? You only need a couple of legs to have it horizontal. You kind of say it comes in here, your overflow is there, your vent is there, your pump feed is here. This is actually where your legs would go, right there and there. So if you had a vertical tank, not horizontal, take a look at the blue arrow on the right. If the pump is at the bottom, where the vertical tank line says, your fill head can drop like that. But with a horizontal tank, you get a lot more fill head over that pump. And even with an electric pump, that's going to give you added fill head. And with a power trap, that's going to give you added fill head. It's going to give you nice capacity, more capacity than you need maybe. But that's good, and you're going to get a lot of added volume per cycle, so you don't have to cycle it all the time. And you get more surface area. Notice the surface area has changed from blue. I'm going to change the top line to red because that's where your flash steam from the condensate in is going across that water. You get a lot of surface area of water at that point, and that helps pull out some of the water droplets that go out the flash line. So I'm just a big fan of horizontal flash tanks. All right, so how do I calculate the flash steam? You can go to TLV Engineering Calculator at TLV.com. You can put in your 8,000 pounds an hour and your pressure 100 to zero, and you get 1,063 pounds an hour flash. So let's size a tank for 1,000 pounds an hour flash, okay? So there's 1,000 pounds. It's a, a receiver chart we have on our pump uh, data sheets. It's three and a half feet long. There's 1,000 pounds an hour flash. I went to TLV.com. I did the flash calculation. It took me about a minute or two. I'm going to read the table. I need a 14-inch receiver diameter, and I need a 6-inch vent, and I'm done. And it's just that easy. Five seconds later, I'm done with my flash vessel. So here's my tank package system. My multiple solutions sources coming in here from different traps. 
goes into the receiver in a power trap package. It's got the overflow to the right. We put a loop seal in the overflow. Whoops, sorry. We put an a, a overflow loop so you don't get vapors coming out of there, just like a P trap under your sink. So let's take a take a look there again at this six foot tall guy. And there is a little GP5. Look at that. 19 inches high with the receiver. You could run it as low as six inches, but even 19 inches high, that's nothing. It's right as kneecaps, for goodness sakes. And you could get 560 pounds an hour at 19 inches high. That's equivalent to 1.1 GPM. So we use a 10% sizing factor. So that's 1.0 GPM actual. So somebody would have an electric pump of about three GPM for that. Same way with a GP10L, it's 30 inches to that inlet. So that's the fill height on the pump. It's actually gonna be roughly equivalent to a 15 GPM electric pump. It's actually 5.6 GPM actual. We go to the medium size pump and that's 32 inches. Look at that, it's right at table height for most tables or countertops. That would be roughly equivalent to a 30 GPM electric pump. 5,000 pounds an hour is what it can do, but we would rate it for the actual 9.1 GPM. And the largest pump is right about at shoulder, just a light about at shoulder height for this gentleman on the left at 50 inches. The overall thing was under 60 inches. And that's going to be roughly equivalent to a 90 GPM electric pump. Wow, how cool is that? All right, <clears throat> we can give you any drawing that you want to see in 2D. We can give you the dimensions. If you need to make it yourself, that's fine. I just show you some of the pump sets that our engineering team did. All of the team members in our consulting and engineering services team make these drawings. Um, but um, I have to thank uh, Justin McFarlane and Andrew Moore for making a lot of specialized drawings for me. So this is just a single pump set. Look how simple that is. You got a receiver, some connections, you got a balance line like I showed you before, you got some check valves, and you have a connection disassembly right here. All right. So you can put it on a heat exchanger like this, and there's your trap in your inlet. So instead of discharging against 20 or 30 pounds of back pressure, the trap's lifting up two feet into this tank, and that's one pound of back pressure, much less trouble for the reboiler or heat exchanger. And if you're in a commercial institution, it's probably smaller than this, you can probably go straight into it. And this is a twin set if you need twice the pumping capacity. I show you the twin set from this side because this is a standard head. It's not the fill height, the fill height goes to the ground but this is the standard head that we're looking at the pump. And if we elevate the receiver, all we do is get acceleration head by elevating the receiver higher. And remember, we didn't show you anything higher than 60 inches off the ground for that center line here. So you don't need nine feet tall uh, receivers. How do we size it? We size it using the condensate recovery application form. This is what it looks like up close. You put in your multiple sources of condensate and the back pressure. Then we'll give you a summary report like this. And on the application summary, we tell you this was your load, 12,000. This was your flash load, 1,011, 8% flash and the back pressure that we're working against. And then we give you the type of unit that can do 12,000 pounds an hour. And you can put it on a schedule. These are some of the things. Are you using steam or air? What's your back pressure? 30. The actual load, 7,000. The design load, 7,700. The fill head from grade, the model of unit, the body material, the check valve, stainless steel. Why use a bronze check valve? That makes your system weak. Use a stainless steel check valve. Make it a more durable check valve. It's so critical that you get tight check valves. And then the receiver diameter there, 14 by 42 and the vent size six and the, you know, so you can put the manufacturer, uh, 
Yes, I did put TLV there. <laughs> okay, so we like to use Hasteloid or Inconel compression springs. We don't like to use tension springs. They snap easier, we think. And we don't like to use stainless steel springs as, uh, you know, the larger pumps. It's just not as durable as Hassel or Inconel. We like side entry motive lines, not top entry for the most part. And we like to see hardened 400 grade trim. Why? Because especially like on the exhaust valve, you're snapping that exhaust valve head into the seat. You don't want to use a 300 grade seat for that because it's going to be soft relative to 400 grade. And that's where we like to see a head of around 65 Rockwell hardness and the seat combination somewhere around 55, 45 Rockwell hardness. We don't want to see something off of the B scale of Rockwell. We're working off of the C scale of Rockwell. We like to use stainless steel check valves, stainless steel internals and lubricated plane bearings. A lot of you that might have used these pumps have noticed that the pins can get accelerated wear. We use lubricated plane bearings so that they don't, don't get accelerated wear and that makes the units last longer. So even though the GP14 is our highest rated pressure of 200 PSI, we don't want to have any issues with float damage. So our float is rated to 1340 PSIG for hydraulic shock. Make a durable system. All right, when you have any type of a pump that has an accelerated discharge in a pump line with a single phase line, high velocity discharge can create a back slam. Over here where you see this yellow blast sort of thing, you can pull a vacuum from high velocity discharge. So we break that vacuum by using a vacuum breaker and a liquid air vent. It can mitigate the severity if you're having back slams like that. All right, just a couple of applications. Here's a skin heater. This tank was actually very high and uh, panel coils on the outlet side. <clears throat> and uh, Justin drew this up. This was really neat. We take multiple traps coming into a manifold. There's a condensate in through one of the traps, goes into the pump. The manifold in this case is what we normally use for tracing, but we can vent out of it because of the size of the pipe and the size of the piping itself. <clears throat> and the pump exhaust goes back up into the vent. The motive steam comes here into the pump and the condensate is discharged out. It's a nice little compact package for pre, you have pre-freeze drainage on the outlet side. And if you wanna drain the body, when you're gonna repair it, you should always put a little valve, like a ball valve or something on the outlet side here so you can drain the body down when you take a look and replace the covering mechanism assembly. This little unit, which could use a GP5C or a GP10L, can get 130 pounds an hour flash and 800 pounds an hour condensate. So if you use a GP5C, it would be less condensate and less flash. If you use a GP10L, it will be 130 or 800. Remember, those units were only 15 inches off the ground or nine inches off the ground. <clears throat> so this is some of the intricate designs that we make. This is on twin reactors, three by four by five. Look at that. You can package stuff as tightly as you want to. This is a quad unit. So this is a force draft coil array on a power plant up north. They were having problems with rotted coils. So here you can actually see the trap bank. We showed them how to put the trap banks in there and the replacement coils and run it all into the power trap pump receiver sets. These are duplex units, 33 coils. Of course, this array for force draft coils in a power plant is really high. And the power trap advantage, it's cavitation free can handle high temperature condensate, no NPSA worries, no NPSHA worries. Low fill height, you saw the most fill height we needed was 60 inches or 55 inches, depending on the models. You don't need to be 10 feet high. Simple TDH calculations. I didn't really get into the chart so much because this is already a long session, but if you look on the SDS for TLV power traps, you see that changes in TDH do not greatly affect the power trap pumps and just take a look at the capacity is not really changed all that much. They're intrinsically safe, non-electric. They can be installed with one trade, easy to select and install. And there's no overheating of any motors. We can use a small 10% sizing factor because we don't have to worry about overheating. So I hope that this session has helped you have peace of mind about your condensate systems, whether they're electric or non-electric systems. Steam is an asset. Condensate is also a very important asset to reduce load on the boiler. 
So we're TLV. We were established in 1950 in Kakagawa, Japan by an R&D engineer. We're an ASME N and NPT manufacturer, which means that we're qualified to make nuclear grade products, which we've been providing nuclear grade products for the last 50 years, more than 50 years. We have multiple certifications. We started here in Japan in 1950 on the far right of the screen. This presentation is coming to you from Charlotte, North Carolina. And I hope you enjoyed this session. As I said, fun with pumps. I hope you had as much fun as I did. And then the next webinar is August the 14th, and it's on Steam Traps 101. It's basic overview. So it's for anyone that doesn't really understand Steam Traps or would like to just get a refresher. It's presented by one of our mechanical engineers in our applications group, Alec Newell, and uh, also the consulting and engineering services manager, Andrew Moore. On August the 28th, we have Steam Traps 102 based on one of my articles in Chemical Engineering Progress. My Steam Trap is good. Why doesn't it work? That will be presented by one of our technical service engineers, a mechanical engineer, Salman Ashrafi, and again, Andrew Moore, the head of CES. So uh, you can sign up for these at tlv.com and webinar registrations. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate all of your kindness. I will tell you that I've been so profoundly uh, influenced and affected by how many of you have attended these webinars. And I want to thank you very, very deeply for all of your support. So I hope that you've enjoyed this session, and I look forward to seeing you the next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone.